Good evening and welcome. I am Sarah Holliday, the library's head of events, and I am just here momentarily to welcome you on behalf of the New York Society Library. That's those of you here in the room with me and those joining in online. And to welcome tonight's presenters, Dr. Jeffrey A. Lieberman and Andrew Solomon. Dr. Lieberman's brand new book, Malady of the Mind, was published just last week. We have copies for sale just outside this room through our independent friends at the Corner Bookstore, and the author will be happy to sign them for you following the presentation. Over his 40-year career, world-renowned psychiatrist Dr. Jeffrey A. Lieberman's groundbreaking research has pioneered a transformative strategy for the early detection and prevention of schizophrenia. A member of the National Academy of Medicine and recipient of the Lieber Prize for Schizophrenia Research, the APA's Adolf Meyer Award, and NAMI Scientific Research Award, Dr. Lieberman has served as president of the American Psychiatric Association. He has contributed to federal legislation to improve mental health care access and quality while reducing stigma associated with mental illness. He is also the author of Shrinks, the Untold Story of Psychiatry, on which he spoke in this room in November of 2015. Kirkus calls Malady of the Mind a compelling and engaging story that shines much needed light into a dark corner of modern society. With Dr. Lieberman tonight is Andrew Solomon, well known to our readers as the author of the National Book Award winning The Noonday Demon, and Far From the Trees, Parents, Children, and the Search for Identity, on each of which he spoke in our lecture series. His other books include Far and Away, Essays from the Brink of Change, Seven Continents, 25 Years. He is a professor of psychology at Columbia University, president of Pan American Center, and a regular contributor to The New Yorker, NPR, and The New York Times Magazine. Now I'm honored to hand the stage over to Dr. Jeffrey A. Lieberman and Andrew Solomon. Thank you. I just want to begin by saying that Dr. Lieberman is not only perhaps the most distinguished clinician working on the topic of schizophrenia today, but also um, a person of extraordinary and uncommon generosity on whom I have called many, many times for help um, with people I knew who were struggling and who has been unfailingly helpful and responsive. And so I have both personal and professional reasons for feeling deeply indebted and very honored to share a stage with you, Jeff. Um, and in my book, Far From the Tree, kindly mentioned just a moment ago, there is a chapter about schizophrenia. And when I was working on it, this is the book that I wanted as the basis for my research and it didn't exist. There were all kinds of academic articles, there were personal memoirs, there were all kinds of odds and ends of stuff, but there was nothing that actually brought it all together, explained what the condition is, explained where we stand with it, gave the history and gave a coherent sense of how one might engage with the larger questions that psychosis brings up. So I'll begin, Jeff, by, um, by asking you just to give for people who aren't fully aware a description of what psychosis really is and how you define the borderlines of schizophrenia and particularly how you diagnose schizophrenia and separate it from the conditions you've written about as well that imitate it and from the other conditions that cluster around them. Wow, and you characteristically goes right to the point <laughs> and, and, and launches a, a barrage of uh, uh, salient questions. Uh, but first, let me just say uh, I'm really happy to be here and to um, have, I'll thank all of you for coming out with the threat of inclement weather and to hear about the discussion of a book uh, of a somewhat arcane subject, which is not as well understood or known as should be, and the book was intended to try and bring greater awareness to. But um, uh, when people think of mental illness, the kind of, I won't say flagship, the poster child uh, it is schizophrenia, because it's it, equivalent to insanity, madness, lunacy. Uh, and um, the reason for that is because it's uh, not sold, but a dominant symptom cluster, which makes the disease so notorious and uh, is psychosis. And psychosis is a term that describes essentially symptoms which reflect a break from reality, meaning that the brain is able to perceive the external world and uh, assimilate its sensory input and uh, make sense of what 
that is, and determine how an individual should respond accordingly. Psychotic symptoms are due to the fact that this mechanism breaks down and that the ability to perceive and then to interpret and respond to the perceived reality uh, is distorted or disrupted or eliminated and in its place become symptoms like delusions which are false ideas that are incorrigible you can't talk somebody out of it uh, <coughs> delusions uh, perceptions that are erroneous or entirely imagined which are hallucinations of any sense modality hearing things seeing things feeling things smelling things um, and also a, a disruption in the or normal thought patterns where there's a logical flow of ideas uh, and psychosis is the cardinal constellation of symptoms that occurs in schizophrenia and is essential to its diagnosis however it's i hope that's not me <laughs> um, and uh, however it is not the only uh, it does not is not the entire clinical profile of individuals with schizophrenia but it's the one that gets all the attention because of its drama uh, and also its potential uh, damaging and, and really tragic effects and what I mean by that is that it's the spectrum of symptoms that can impel people to do horrific things that they have no basis for doing. Mass violence, living on the streets homeless, running around with uh, naked or without shoes in, home, in freezing weather, committing crimes and ending up in jail. Uh, and um, it's something that is probably the most destructive component. Now, psychosis is not unique to schizophrenia. Um, just like uh, you can have coughing, or you can have congestion, or you can have fever associated with different illnesses. It's a set of symptoms. They occur in different conditions. They can occur in what's now called bipolar disorder. It used to be manic depressive illness. It can occur in severe depression with psychotic symptoms. And it very commonly occurs in dementia, particularly uh, Alzheimer's disease at an advanced stage where people, after losing their memory, having cognitive impairment, um, may become psychotic with symptoms of delusions, hallucinations, and then become agitated and act on these in the consequence. So it's, it's a constellation of symptoms like those other disorders, but is really kind of the most pernicious and hallmark symptom of schizophrenia. Um, thank you for that um, and that very lucid explanation. I wonder whether we can talk about what is to me in a way the most interesting thing about this book, which is that it's essentially a very optimistic volume. When I started writing about depression many years ago, we were in the midst of the revolution in which depression became a more treatable illness than it previously had been. It still obviously claims many victims, tragically. Um, but schizophrenia, at the time that I started writing about it, which was more recent, um, was uh, really, despite the development of the initial antipsychotics, was essentially a life sentence to something dire and terrible. And part of what you now read in the book is the ways in which earlier and earlier diagnosis, even during the program, is allowing for interventions that prevent the enlargement of ventricles, the loss of brain matter, and so on and so forth. So tell me about optimism here and, and where you come to it. Well, I don't know if people have uh, heard about this, this book, but um, first of all, this is not, you know, the kind of uh, bestseller like, uh, um, what's Harry's book called? <laughs> Spare. This is, not, this, is, this is not Spare. So, um, uh, but there have been some successful books, commercially speaking, about schizophrenia, most recently of which was Hidden Valley Road. So Hidden Valley Road was a, a story by a journalist, Robert Coker, excellent book, uh, which is like, it's like going to watch a horror movie, a terrible movie. It's so sad uh, because it's about a family in Colorado that has 12 children and six of them have schizophrenia and everything bad that you can imagine happening to somebody who's mentally ill happens to them and they get the worst of all possible treatments. So I consider this the kind of antidote to Hidden Valley Road and, and, and to, I, I appreciate the fact that at the 
last chapter in, in his book, he uh, references the possibilities of research leading to better treatment than his family got, and he actually mentions me in my research. So he was on to the right thing. Uh, but unfortunately, it hasn't existed until very recently and isn't widely available or uh, 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 received by, by many people who were affected with the illness. Um, so uh, there is optimism, but it's only recent and it's not widely known and it's not uh, even widely believed. Um, so historically, you know, Susan Sontag had this wonderful book, uh, Illness is Metaphor when she had breast cancer, and she talked about how people changed in the way they reacted to her when they knew she had breast cancer. And this is back in the 1950s. And uh, it's because illness creates a certain, I won't say stigma, but impression or, or a set of reactions that are refracted through the culture of the time, which reflects the level of knowledge about the condition. And if there's no information about the illness and no treatment for the illness, you know, people's imaginations, culture, society can go wild. So leprosy, a plague, uh, tuberculosis, cancer, AIDS, and these wild, discriminatory, stigmatized impressions were uh, dispelled or mitigated or refracted into a more realistic understanding only when science brought an understanding of the illness and treatments that could treat it. Um, in terms of schizophrenia, historically this was perceived through history, because it's not a new illness, it's not like COVID, um, through the culture of the time. So historically in ancient times, it was supernatural. People were demonized or sanctified. Uh, as a result of this, because the only way to explain this kind of bizarre behavior was the gods. Uh, in the Middle Ages, it had to do with religious heresy or moral deviance. And then after the Enlightenment, there was an effort to understand these as natural conditions, but there was no knowledge by which to explain these natural conditions. So you had all these preposterous theories. Um, and it was only really in the latter 20th century that science basically provided the elements to understand what could cause these massive disturbances in someone's mental function and behavior. Um, and um, these were, unfortunately, uh, the first one that was accepted and became dominant was uh, the uh, neurodevelopmental hypothesis that genes cause schizophrenia. Therefore, it was like autism or Down syndrome or Fragile X syndrome, except it, the phenotype didn't manifest till adolescence instead of at birth or in the first two years, but it meant that people were doomed from the womb. And you know that wasn't terribly uh, optimistic or encouraging. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that was the prevailing view. And even with the advent of the antipsychotic drugs, that could suppress the psychotic symptoms that cause people to run amok and do all kinds of uh, things. Um, it was thought that those symptoms, those drug treatments were like symptom reducing treatments. So right now for Alzheimer's disease, which all of us are concerned about, we're getting to a certain age, um, there's two strategies or two targets for treatment. Uh, one is, and the only one that we have treatments for are called symptom improving treatments. Aricept, the cholinesterase inhibitors, and these for people who are experiencing cognitive decline associated with Alzheimer's enable some limited increase in cognitive function. But if you take it away, the individual is at the same point that they would have progressed to even in the absence of the treatment. There's no disease modifying treatment that prevents the progression. So when the antipsychotics were a miraculous discovery, uh, were proven to work was thought that they were simply suppressing the symptoms, but they weren't going to alter the ultimate outcome of the illness, which was basically to cause a person to become disabled, demented, and functionally impaired. Um, so it wasn't a very optimistic uh, or salutary view of what treatments could do. And what the research that's reflected in the book is trying to communicate is that 
that is a uh, mistake, or that is a uh, uh, em overemphasizing one view of the illness at a certain point of time and not recognizing more recent research, which offers a much different perspective on the efficacy of treatments, the nature of the illness, and the ability to modify the course of the illness and the outcome of the illness. And uh, I don't know if the book will become controversial, but there will probably be individuals, you know, whether it's lay people with firm relatives or colleagues of mine, who may take uh, an issue with the optimism and psychiatry has been guilty of over-promising in the past. So it's understandable why people would be skeptical, but I'll stake my scientific reputation on it. Well, I'd like to say I think it's a more optimistic book than Spare. So if you're choosing <laughs> two, and optimism is what you're after, I go with malady of mind. Um, so, Jeff, you alluded a moment ago to the public image of schizophrenia, which is to associate it with violence. Um, it's very striking that in American culture today, every time there's an appalling act of gun violence in particular, the immediate outcry is for better mental health services. But those better mental health services seem to be addressed not to helping the people who are suffering from mental illnesses, but rather to uh, rather to protecting the rest of us from them. And I think that that language has created a sense of a terrible chasm between the experience of the rest of us and the experience of people who have schizophrenia. And one of the things that you represent very aptly in the book is that that can be very distorting in terms of policy um, and that it has limited the extent to which research can be conducted. So when you think about schizophrenia, what do you think of it as being in terms of its danger to other people? What do you think its effects are on the larger society, which is after all one of her chapters, as opposed to the effects that it has simply on um, the person directly affected? Well, um, first of all, let me say, uh, schizophrenia is not a rare disease. It's not a rare disease. Um, uh, it's a disease that has a lifetime prevalence of 1%, meaning uh, the United States uh, population, approximately 3 million people would be affected by it. Uh, and uh, actually, this will be uh, sort of a uh, foreshadowing of a subsequent question if you want to ask it. Um, the incidence is actually going up because of the fact that um, the uh, liberalization of policies for use and access to previously recreational drugs uh, is um, increasing. And just so happens that some of these recreational drugs are precipitants of the onset of schizophrenia in vulnerable individuals. So it's not a rare disease historically now, but it's actually gonna become more common. Um, so schizophrenia has a notorious reputation for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, one of which uh, is that the people who have it run amok and do bad things like kill people for no reasons um, or disrupt society. It was actually this uh, behavioral disturbance that they caused which uh, historically led to the standard way of managing the disease in the population which was asylums. So asylums were thought to be havens to treat people in a humane way who were infirmed and either had to be maintained by their families or they wandered in society causing various types of disruption. Um, and the idea was to put them in a environment that was trying to encourage uh, humane, salutary, hygienic conditions and by putting them in this environment, perhaps they really behaviorally condition them in a way that would be therapeutic. Uh, that didn't work. Um, the uh, putting them in a good place did work, but the whole purpose was to remove them to society. And uh, actually the name that was given, so the, the paradigm or the, the, the convention was put them in a place where they're self-contained uh, in a place outside of a rural, I mean, of an urban environment 
maybe even give it a, a kind of a fanciful name, you know, uh, that was sounding euphemistically beneficial. And the heads of these were psychiatrists. In fact, the first name of the American Psychiatric Association was the Association of Asylum Superintendents. Um, and they were called, and you may have read the book by Caleb Carr, I think, uh, or the series, they were called Alienists because they lived alien to society. Um, but they became snake bits. Um, so that didn't work. And um, the problem which led to not just their uh, notorious perception, but led to their public nuisance uh, actually came about as a catastrophic failure in a uh, government policy, which was deinstitutionalization, um, which came about as a result of good intentions. Good intentions path the uh, or pave the, the path, pathway to hell. Um, 1963, JFK, part motivated by his own personal experience with his sister Rosemary, who actually had affective psychosis, bipolar disorder, with developmental disability at birth from a traumatic delivery. Uh, this was a way of trying to make up for the damage that uh, occurred to her. But he signed a bill in 1963 which provided for the release of people from state mental hospitals, which at the time numbered close to 600,000, to community treatment. It sounded good. State governments were only too happy because they could save the money on state mental hospitals, uh, but it ended up disastrously because there was not sufficient community resources and there was homelessness. They were transferred to the streets, to nursing homes or to jails, um, and they became public distractions, nuisances, or menaces. Now, the most uh, pernicious of these consequences, these social pathologies, as I call them, um, was the possibility of violence. Okay, And if you say this, that mentally ill people are potentially violent or serial killers are perpetrators of mass violence, and you talk to any advocate, and Sarah in her introduction talked about, I won this research award from NAMI. NAMI is an acronym for National Alliance of Mentally Ill. <laughs> They will push back vehemently. Say, mentally ill people are not more violent; they're more likely to be victims of violence, which is true. Of all of the criminal violence in the United States that occurs annually, people with mental illness only account for four percent. However, if you take mass violence, which is more than four or five people, oftentimes complete strangers, no perceivable motive. Um, Mentally ill people account for close to 40%. The other categories are basically ideological zealots, Timothy McVeigh, um, or disgruntled, uh, a, a disgruntled uh, people who are alienated from society. And I don't want to or generalize, but the angry postal worker who gets fired and comes back and shoots up. But mentally ill people do perpetrate. You have Andrea Yates, who killed her children. You have James Holmes, who did it in the Batman uh, premiere in Colorado. And Jared Loeffner, who shot Gabrielle Giffords, the congresswoman. Um, I have consulted on numerous cases of these. And these individuals are not impelled by any rational motive. They're impelled by their symptoms. Voices are telling them to do something because they're being attacked or they're in danger. Um, so the reality is that now all of these people have uh, the same things in common. They're generally, well, they're all untreated, meaning their symptoms are allowed to be floridly influential on their behavior. And uh, they're usually young, meaning in their early stages of the illness, and most frequently they're male. Um, so, you know, this gets all the attention. If people die on the south side of Chicago in any given week, they get very little attention compared to if um, uh, Sung Hyun Wei on the Virginia Tech campus kills 12 people uh, because he's running amok, uh, impelled by his psychotic symptoms. So 
The reality is, is that there is a reality, a danger factor. The last thing I'll say is, um, when I was a, so I, I've spent my professional career in New York City uh, at one of the various uh, academic institutions. Um, but I was at the University of North Carolina at Duke for 10 years. And when I was there, basketball reigned supreme. It was a real uh, honor or privilege to get a phone call from Mike Krzyzewski or Dean Smith. So I get a call from Dean Smith one day. He wants me to see if I can help him do him a favor. Uh, his best friend was a, uh, a golf pro named Buck Adams at the local country club. And Buck and his wife had a children, and they had a son. And the son had schizophrenia, and the son was 20 years old, and he either wasn't being treated or he was not being treated well. For no reason, one day, he goes into his father's hunting lodge or area where he keeps his, um, his hunting shotguns, he takes one out, and he goes into his father's room where his father's taking a nap, and he shoots him and kills him. I mean, there's no logical reason. He then is remanded to Dorothea Dix State Hospital, named after Dorothea Dix, the Great Crusader, um, and an NGRI uh, fine or ruling. Um, and he's treated, and he's clear as a bell. No hallucinations, no delusions, thinking clearly. He can't get out because he's a menace to society, and they can't rely on the prosecutors would necessarily agree to not press charges in the case if he was. So this is part of the, and I don't know how many people might remember it, but there's many, many notorious cases in New York City. The wild man of 96th Street, who used to abuse cars and for a period of years. Billy Boggs during the Koch administration, who used to be hospitalized, come out, live on, a, you know, heating grates on the sidewalk. Um, these are, this, this is the public perception, and it's a perception that gives the illness such a unsavory and notorious reputation. And I wouldn't say it's entirely, but it's largely preventable. Um, yes. So one of the things that the book deals with is the importance of family in treatment. The idea that while the biochemical explanations are absolutely crucial and the biological interventions, medications and so on have played an enormous role, that actually there's a need for family to be involved and for the larger society to be involved. So thinking in relation to family, if I were to come to you and say, um, as I hope not to, but if I were to come to you um, and say that, uh, that my own child or the child of someone I knew appeared to be developing schizophrenia, what would be the, what would be the way forward? How would you begin from there? What does the knowledge that we have now dictate in terms of what it makes sense to do? Well, first, Andrew, um, that is a much more complex question or, or uh, to answer in this day and age than it might have been previously because the process of growing up now and going through navigating through adolescence into adulthood, the relationship with parents, um, the kind of dissolution or uh, uh, a dilution of, of authority figures, including parental authority, uh, has changed things, the dynamics. And um, uh, as a result, you know, the vicissitudes of behavior during adolescence <clears throat> that occur normally because of the maturational process as well as the cultural process, which you know, marinates kids in a whole variety of um, uh, you know, thought processes and ideologies and cultural influences as well as you know, access to the internet um, you know, uh, can induce or impel kids to uh, behaviors that are not necessarily genetically, constitutionally, biologically pathologic, but there was a great term that uh, the psychiatrist and philosopher of the 19th century, Carl Jaspers, coined, which are pathoplastic. So um, pathoplastic conditions are those that the environment of the society induces. So for example, um, 
there was never a disease called obesity. Now there's an FDA indication for developing treatments for obesity. Um, we have a problem in this country. Why? Because of our nutritional uh, proclivities and the way um, our foods, food substances are produced in fast foods and so forth. Um, similarly, uh, with the availability of recreational drugs, we're also inducing this. So these are pathoplastic factors, but um, so it's harder. The other thing is that um, psychiatry and its uh, struggle to try and characterize the nature of illnesses and carve nature at its joints, uh, identify the pathologic, physiologic underpinnings and develop treatments, came up with some pretty preposterous ideas uh, for schizophrenia. There was the notorious schizophrenogenic mother, uh, Frieda from Reichman coined, uh, and there was also the family dynamic where the families had pernicious intra-family relationships that were causal and family therapy was seen. So those have been debunked, thankfully. Um, so when a person, a family, a parent comes and says, I'm concerned about my kid and could this possibly be you know, antecedents or prodromal mm -hmm. signs of schizophrenia, uh, it's important to evaluate this. My opinion is that uh, our recommendation is you, you can't you can't be too careful. You know you you want to not be conservative. You want to be over vigilant and over protective. And really, the, the first um, the first line of defense is your pediatrician, and then maybe the schools. Although you know the New York City private school schools uh, they have, they're trigger happy in terms of anything that steps out of normal behavior, it's either a learning disability or a mental disorder, nascent mental disorder. But um, the point is, is, is uh, do see consultation. Um, however, the, uh, the value of identifying early, intervening early, is potential ability to mitigate the consequences of an illness and uh, maximize the, 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 the quality of outcome um, uh, is uh, to be as vigilant as early as you can, um, but not to jump in too quickly. And even if it involves just monitoring, you know, for prostate cancer, recipient stages, watchful waiting, um, watchful waiting. But I would say that uh, you would need an evaluation it wouldn't be an evaluation necessarily as with the uh, uh, alacrity with which ADHD is diagnosed and stimulants prescribed. Uh, it would be an evaluation to see how clear are the behaviors or the um, uh, ostensible symptoms that a adolescent is manifesting. Uh, how likely is it that these are indicative of uh, eminent uh, you know, evolution into a diagnosable syndrome or whether they're part of the vagaries of behavior during adolescence, which are quite wide and extreme. Um, and, uh, and then only at a certain point, if it becomes definitive, then consider intervening with treatment. Um, and in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the process of doing so, uh, manage the tensions that can exist between family members, parents, and the children uh, in terms of uh, what the kids may see as their children's trying to, their parents trying to control them, trying to limit their kind of exploratory behaviors. They're, they go through and trying to define their own identity and become autonomous adults, uh, but at the same time being watchful and trying to protect them against things that may be um, either just reckless uh, or risky behaviors or even you know, more indicative of the onset of illness and needing to have an intervention. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that um, being watchful, and this isn't being helicopter parents, this is being watchful of things that um, are, are, are potential uh, uh, ailments or fallibilities that all kids may may fall prey to um, is 
more than ever necessary now and not to be hesitant to seeking consultation um, in the event that you know your concern reaches a certain threshold of concern now the last thing i'll say and then i'll stop for this um, it's unfortunate but it's uh unclear who you see for that consultation i mean you know if you break a leg you know there's no question you've got to see an orthopedist you know if you have a rash you've got to see a dermatologist if you have a heart problem um you have a behavioral problem who do you see you know you see your clergyman a counselor psychologist a social worker a therapist a psychiatrist or pediatric neurologist and when it comes to the behavioral uh, providers um, the range the standardization of quality uh, the awareness of you know who are adequately competent uh, is much harder to identify uh, I mean, have you ever known somebody who says, I go to the second best doctor? <laughs> Nobody does. And they all think they go to the best doctors. But uh, I have to say that uh, maybe as much as 50% of what I do is to re-diagnose and redirect treatment. Um, so uh, the question is, how do you find the right person to go to? And uh, there's not an easy answer to that. There is an answer to that, but I'll save that for another time. Uh, I found that the best way to find a good provider in the field of mental health is to call Jeff Lieberman himself <laughs> <laughs> uh, volunteering at the end of this conversation. I'm going to take questions from the audience in a moment, and I think some of you have scribbled them down on uh, little note cards, and if you'd like to pass those along in my general direction, mm -hmm. I will be glad to have a look at them. Can I get a card? How does one get a card? but uh, Tina why don't you just ask a question oh, I'm well I'm not clear what so what is the treatment I mean so you have a you know someone with schizophrenia you've decided yes this is psychosis this is schizophrenia what's the treatment well the treatment for schizophrenia depends on the stage of the illness that you identify the person if a person is at the beginning of the illness the first episode um, then uh, it's really an aggressive strategy of what uh, is called disease management meaning it's not simply a pill it's really a uh, providing an array of services that will address the symptoms they have and the potential consequences and it begins with um, medication uh, but it also requires the ability to, to enable them what happens so the typical story is someone in high school or college begins to develop symptoms they are interfering, they finally get sent for referral to the student health service or to a doctor at a medical center, and then they're treated. And after their symptoms are suppressed and they're normal, they don't want to lose the semester, and they want to rush back to school, and they do. And they don't like this, this uh, taking medication because it stigmatizes them. They don't like the side effects that may cause them and may impede their cognitive function, they think, so they stop it. And then they relapse. And this begins to put them on the slippery slope to deterioration. So um, medication suppresses psychosis. But the other symptom dimensions of the illness, cognitive cognition, uh, don't respond as rapidly. Medication doesn't help that. Somebody can't jump back into the academic ring immediately. They have to have a period of cognitive remediation to enable them to get back to the college or the school they were in and perform at the level they did before. Secondly, they probably need to have uh, a therapeutic relationship, which is going to help them navigate the problems or the questions they have about how do I, how do I resume my life socially, familially, educationally, uh, given what's happened to me because I don't know most people don't know what that means schizophrenia is not a one-time deal that you get sick and you're recovered and you're done with it's a lifetime thing that can be irreparably damaging and produce a you turn somebody who is the brightest and the best into an emotional invalid so you need to have these what I call psychosocial services in addition to that to guide the individual in a 
not uh, rapid, but deliberate fashion back into normalization. On the other hand, if you're seeing somebody who's been ill for 15 or 20 years, had six or eight uh, psychotic episodes for which they've been hospitalized, um, has already sustained the progressive effects of the illness, which do erode someone's intellectual capacity and produces atrophy of some portions of the brain, uh, your, your uh, strategy is different and your, uh, your goals are more modest. That's not to say that they can't lead a reasonable uh, life, but they'll never be the same as they were, but they can lead a life in which they're stable. They're not a constant burden to their family. They don't have to be locked up in a state hospital and they can function at some level, which is satisfying. But that also involves a disease management strategy where it's not just medication, it's also rehabilitative uh, services for cognitive and social rehabilitation, and also having um, a place to socialize because they can't socialize in the usual way, and oftentimes residential, supervised residential places. And the tragedy of our system, don't <laughs> they don't exist. And as you well know, Tina, uh, the situation for developmental disabilities is worse. And so the, the deep, dark secret, of deep, the deep, dark secret of our society is that um, it's not that everybody says, oh, these treatments don't work. These people are not going to get better. These things are just uh, not hopeless, but they're really uh, 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 there's not much we can do. That's not true. The problem is there's a, a lack of social political will. If you have cancer, if you have breast cancer and you go to you know, MSK or any hospital and they say, oh, you need a lumpectomy, you need radiation, you need chemotherapy, but we can only do the lumpectomy. That's what exists for now. You cannot find state-of-the-art treatment for schizophrenia or for developmental disabilities in any single place even the best places in the, in the country. Mm -hmm. And that's simply prejudicial stigma and the lack of social and political will. Um, uh, I was uh, recently asked to help someone, not in New York, but who was uh, trying to get into treatment and have been told that the wait time for the place where he uh, or where the family was seeking treatment was six to eight weeks. This was someone who was acutely suicidal. Mm -hmm. And I called and said, look, can't you find a place for this person? And uh, I, well, there was a certain amount of interaction and then I was told, yes, we've actually, we've got a place and you know, we'll take him in on Tuesday. And I was then speaking to a lower level administrator about the details of his hospitalization, who said to me, I said, how can you have a six to eight week wait for people who are suicidal? And the administrator said to me, there actually isn't a six to eight week waiting list. She said, we're so oversubscribed that the only people who get in are people who have a connection to a doctor or a donor or somebody else who can get them into the um, organization. They said, six to eight weeks is what we say because it's long enough to put people off. Um, and, uh, and I was horrified, uh, of course, by that. But what are the mechanisms through which we can address the deficit of treatment? What, what I mean, Tina has asked the question, what should we do? You've said, this is what we should do, but there's nowhere to do it. How can we bring about a change in which you can actually treat people and help them and use not the knowledge that we are yet to acquire, but the knowledge we currently have so that we can actually help the people who are ill to get as well as they can be? Uh, I, you know, I, I'm going to say I don't have an answer to that because I've tried. Um, let me give you one other anecdote that illustrates what uh, Andrew's saying uh, even more dramatically. So I don't know if I put this in the book or not. Rosemary knows. Uh, somebody wrote me, uh, wrote me, um, just a stranger from somewhere who has a mentally ill child, uh, and she took her son to the emergency room because he was psychotic and suicidal, and uh, they couldn't admit him because they didn't have uh, availability and they couldn't transfer him or so forth. 
So uh, she was uh, discharged from the emergency room, and the kid ran away from her, and they had to get the uh, security from the hospital to chase him and so forth. But by that time, he had gone into a adjacent building and had gone up to the roof. He jumped off the roof, and he broke. Uh, he had uh, uh, orthopedic uh, injuries, and they admitted him right away. Um, so that. Um, you know, the, the answer is, uh, it, you know, it's a matter of tolerance. And I mean, there's an element of, well, first of all, people with um, families of people with mental illness don't form uh, a active voting constituency that puts pressure on politicians. Uh, secondly, we don't have a healthcare system, we have a health business system. Um, my hospital, New York Presbyterian, the chair of medicine of which is sitting behind there, no pressure, Don, don't worry. Um, uh, how, if I need, if I have an emergency in medicine to get somebody in, I call Don Landry. I call, I call the chair of medicine instead of going through what would be a more systematic route of it. If, if somebody has a psychiatric problem, it's, it, you know, unless you're like on the board of trustees and you can get uh, the CEO of the hospital to pull some strings, um, it's difficult, and even then, though, the, the 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 array of services that are proven to work and should be available to people with the various you know disorders or indications are not available. We don't have addiction services. During the opiate epidemic, there was this like great plea to for hospitals to expand their addiction and treatment services. Um, we submitted three proposals to the hospital, you know, one a very ambitious one, one a more modest one, second minimalistic one, none of them were funded. Um, the, 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 treat, the only way that people can find adequate treatment for a disease like schizophrenia that has this disease managerial multidisciplinary need is to cobble it together. Uh, cobble it together by finding individual providers and then it's in most cases insurance coverage doesn't cover it um, so uh, it's it's a situation this you know a quote that i think i used in the book was that you know the fault your brutus is not in the stars it's in ourselves you know our society our government does not have they're not motivated to apply the adequate social political will to provide this, and if you think it may occur in many areas of medicine, but none more glaring than in mental illness and schizophrenia. Um, I'm pleased to see that there are any number of questions, uh, and uh, there are three here which are all essentially addressing the same matter. I have to say, one of the exciting things about reading a uh, malady of the mind is that. Jeff Lieberman, who I've known for 30 years as a um, serious and astute scholar, uh, but reveals his own history of uh, experimentation with psychedelics and other substances that are generally categorized as being of abuse. Um, so that's sort of revelatory and entertaining. But the, uh, <laughs> the questions are all... <laughs> um, the questions are all about um, are all about those drugs. Or is there promise in psychedelics as treatment? Um, or um, a specific drugs that are recreationally used um, being associated with increased schizophrenia? And what are the recreational drugs you are most concerned about as a potential trigger? And is alcohol a risk as well? So why don't you comment on psychedelics and other substances of abuse and their relationship to schizophrenia? Well, to tell you, know, if you have a, a, a young person with schizophrenia who you've you know, managed to treat uh, during an acute episode and uh, produced, you know, brought them to symptom remission and they want to know how can I go on with my life with the adequate support. And if you say, well, you can't take anything, you can't do anything, you can't drink anything, you can't take anything, um, that's not going to be to winning a, uh, uh, an admonition or recommendation. Um, so you have to be, I, at least I try and be uh, you know, candid with them. So uh, the different recreational intoxicants, some are better and some are worse, depending on what you have. Um, and 
uh, in the case of um, schizophrenia, alcohol, no problem. I mean, as long as you drink modestly or social drinker. Uh, opiates, no problem. You know, if you want to take opiates. Um, uh, on the other hand, methamphetamine, cocaine, terrible. I mean, that's that's like pouring gasoline on a fire. Um, psychedelics, surprisingly, are not nearly as dangerous as methamphetamine and cocaine stimulants. Um, in fact, when psychedelics were first discovered and being researched in <clears throat> the 1950s and 60s, um, they were thought to be psychotogens that mimicked schizophrenia. Uh, except when they gave them to people with schizophrenia, <clears throat> the intoxication that they had was qualitatively different than the state of being actively psychotic. And so you can actually give LSD or peyote or mescaline to individuals who have schizophrenia. It's not going to help them. It's not going to help them a whit, but it's not going to be as harmful as stimulants would be. On the other hand, cannabis, cannabis is really probably lighting a fire in our society to cause an increased frequency of schizophrenia. So it's hard to make an argument that cannabis shouldn't be made uh, legally available because how can you say it's more uh, detrimental than alcohol or tobacco has been in terms of our public health. On the other hand, for people that have constitutional susceptibilities to psychotic disorders, um, it's absolutely positively proven that it acts as a precipitant. So the question that <clears throat> you frequently get uh, is, do drugs cause mental illness? Do drugs cause schizophrenia? And the answer historically has been no. Um, they don't cause schizophrenia, but they can precipitate it in individuals who are predisposed to it. And that's what cannabis does. It's a mild uh, hallucinogenic THC, which is able to induce this, in, especially if someone is using it chronically and in high potency. He said, you know, the, the real unknown tragedy or consequence of, of the legalization of cannabis is that the commercialization of it has resulted in strains that are sold in the various dispensaries, which have much higher THC concentrations than we smoked when we were in college. Although, you know, we didn't inhale, of course. But, um, <laughs> uh, you know, it's two to ten percent. Then now it's you know, of eighty percent in some cases. Um, so that that's that's really a bad thing. And ketamine also. Ketamine is again gasoline on a fire. Mm -hmm. um, so the answer is you get to tell people. And these are young people who want to get on with their lives, they want to adhere to treatment, they have the possibility of moving forward without having any type of residual symptoms and disability. Um, you have to tell them what they can do and what they can't do and form an alliance that will make them comfortable as opposed to being, you know, just overly rigid and conservative and you can't do anything that's a recreational intoxicant. I think there's one caveat I forgot to mention, and I'm sorry. Um, so the you know historical notion that drugs can't cause schizophrenia has actually been debunked, um, and uh, that with the, in, in the sense that um, if you have no genetic predisposition, uh, no constitutional factors that can cause your brain to lead you to develop schizophrenia. Um, you can still become schizophrenic if you use methamphetamine or fencyclidine on a repeated basis. And the way that was discovered was uh, from World War II. So in World War II, the Germans and the Japanese used methamphetamine for the purposes of the Blitzkrieg, kamikaze pilots, and everything. Um, but that was then, and most of the people that used it were killed in the war. But after the war, Japan's economy was devastated. And of course, they rebuilt it so that they were the enemy of the world, you know, by the 1990s. Uh, how did they do it? 
they fed all their factory workers methamphetamine. And these people who had no predisposition to developing the illness developed schizophrenia symptoms. And even when they were withdrawn from it, they sustained the symptoms for the rest of their lives. So it's possible to induce it uh, by exogenous means of these substances. So avoid Japanese factory employment. <laughs> um, I think we're going to wind up because I think we're running out of time though. So we hear a lot more questions. Um, uh, but I think I'll go with um, uh, the question of uh, whether schizophrenia is genetic. Um, the question includes uh, wondering whether it can be detected in a regular genetic panel. Um, which it cannot, but what uh, overall, you just talked about a genetic vulnerability, which is why I've chosen that question. What is the nature of that vulnerability and what uh, progress are we making toward being able to map the genetics of, uh, of schizophrenia? So very, very quickly, because I, I think I've been really long-winded in my answers. Um, uh, the key is, is diagnostic assessment. So, and this is particularly important um, at the beginning of the illness when somebody's first presenting, but you know, even if somebody comes into you uh, at 20 years into an illness with a medical record that's you know, 10 volumes high, you have to just you know, begin as if it's a new case. Um, the metaphor I use is like peeling an onion. So schizophrenia, Every illness in medicine started out by being described by its symptoms, okay? Uh, Caesar had epilepsy, Caesar, Caesar, but they call it falling sickness. People who had dropsy um, had congestive heart failure, but because fluid accumulated in their legs, they called it dropsy. Um, diabetes, you know, physicians would taste the urine and see if it was sweet or watery. Um, but then as science and technology improved, there was a test that could identify the underlying pathology. So you could do a diagnostic test for diabetes. You could do an EKG for uh, coronary ischemia. You could do an EEG for epilepsy. Um, and then in some cases, you could find the cause of the illness. You could culture an organism in pneumonia and find out it's peptococcal pneumonia. Um, mental illness is still at the first level. It's descriptive. And that by nature means it's, um, it's, it's heterogeneous and fallible to uh, imitations or other condition, other causes of a clinical picture that looks like the illness. So the term I use in the book is that there's genocopies, phenocopies, and facsimiles. And so if you have somebody you think is experiencing symptoms of that sort, the key thing is a clear and thorough diagnosis. Um, and uh, example, you know, one cause, which was described in a popular book called Brain on Fire by Susanna Cahallon, is an autoimmune condition, an autoimmune a reaction that produces an antibody that binds to proteins in the brain that then induce symptoms of schizophrenia, the treatment for which are immune suppressive treatments, not antipsychotic drugs. Um, another phenocopy is what I was just saying about drugs, somebody who uses drugs successfully. Um, but in terms of the genes, um, the majority of cases that are genuinely schizophrenia, not, genocopy, not phenocopies, um, have a genetic diathesis, a genetic underlying cause, and uh, the majority of these cases are multigenic, meaning they're caused by multiple genes in an additive, which confer vulnerability in an additive fashion. And the problem with that is that it doesn't lend itself easily to a diagnostic test. You know, there are, are panels, usually microarrays with certain genes that uh, are assessed, but they just give you a very kind of general probabilistic uh, result as to whether they're consistent with a pattern of schizophrenia. On the other hand, 
there's a small proportion, and we don't know the exact population frequency of people who have schizophrenia, who have single rare mutations of critical genes in terms of brain function. And um, we discovered this in the past couple of years by doing studies in backwards of state mental hospitals where we have the worst of the worst. Um, and those should be done at the beginning of the illness because there's no point in flogging somebody with medications that aren't going to work. And what was found is that in individuals that have these rare mutations, if their gene product is druggable, meaning the gene product, the protein they produce is something for which there are already treatments being used for other conditions that you could then try for them, they actually work. So these cases you know, can be sort of rescued in this way. Um, this isn't traditionally done. So anyway, to come to the point, the key is the genetics are uh, central to the etiology in terms of their clinical application right now. It's limited. It's not like cancer or it's not like cardiovascular disease. Or, um, uh, but it should be employed, um, but it's most usefully employed early in the course of the illness as opposed as, to a, as a last resort. But the main thing is the diagnostic process has to be very thorough and rigorous to take into account all these possibilities other than uh, genetically caused, naturally occurring schizophrenia. So one could ask dozens more questions. Um, I, indeed, could ask dozens more questions. But um, And some of you have asked dozens more questions, which I will pass on um, uh, to Dr. Lieberman. I think he will be happy to talk to you as you come to have the books you are about to purchase signed. Sign <laughs> um, and uh, I think it uh, rests to me to say that this has been extremely illuminating um, and uh, that you can tell uh, listening to Jeff how much knowledge is packed into um, uh, the um, head beneath the white hair on my right. So I want to thank all of you for coming. Um, uh, I want to uh, appreciate again everyone's courage in coming despite the blizzard. Um, many of you are wearing very nice shoes. I hope you're able to get home before they're destroyed. And. Uh, and uh, to say that really, you know, often I find that friends of mine write books that I don't much care for, and there's an endless dance of tact that one goes through. <laughs> but in this instance, I really can say unconditionally, this is an extremely insightful, useful, important book. So thanks to you.